Welcome back, guys, to the Great Ace Attorney Adventures, where last episode we began the adventure of the unspeakable story with two months having passed living in the attic of 221B Baker Street and no cases having been received for Narahodo to attend to. With Suzado having been delivered a telegram on the outset of this day that she intends not to share with Ryanosuke. We attended breakfast downstairs in Shoms' suite only to find Herlock in a state of super depression over his missing musical talent. This was until we pointed out that his violin was in fact a viola, pronounced that way, traded seemingly in mistake by the local pawnbroker Windebanks. So we now head out to obtain Shoms' beloved Stradivarius. Also, to start off the thing, I do now know what Wagaheim means. It basically just means I. It's a classical way to say I, used by older men of high social stature, using the title of Sosuke Natsume's book, I Am a Cat, as well. So it's kind of like, I guess Wagahai would be like, I? Kind of like that kind of I, I guess. I? Most likely. So, before we move on to the pawnbrokers, I think we should examine the rest of uh, Shomes' suite. See what everything says, and move on from there, don't you? Fire's burning comfortingly in the grate again today. It's a very different feeling to a Japanese hibachi somehow. Oh, look at that photographic print of a lady displayed on the mantelpiece. Could it be? Yes, it must be. It's the woman. Oh, how exciting. Is that supposed to mean something to me? It's the woman. It's the woman. Looks like that huge metal chest is being used as a table for tea and coffee. It seems very sturdy, with an equally sturdy lock. Mr. Nadahodo, you mustn't go around opening things. I always have to keep an eye on you, don't I? You're very mischievous. How did you come to that conclusion? There's all sorts on these shelves. Chemistry apparatus, books, papers, and lots of things I've never seen before. It's all heaped up so high, I can't help feeling that the whole lot is going to topple out any moment. Oh, it's such a charmingly untidy collection of paraphernalia, isn't it? It just looks messy to me, like my desk. But you, Mr. Narahodo, must learn to tidy up after yourself. No favoritism there, then. Alright, let's check out more over here. If there is anything more to check out, to be perfectly fair. It felt like that lever should have been check outable. Look at Mr. Shums' desk. It's completely clear. Is that enormous machine usually on it? We can never hope to understand what goes on in the great detective's mind, Mr. Nadahodo. Why? Next time we're invited, we may find he's vacated the entire suite. That's scarily plausible, actually. And just all these papers strewn on the floor. But that looks to be everything to explore at this point in Shums' suite. Unless I've missed something, of course. So, with that said and done... I guess, now we can't really converse to you anymore, we move on at last. To Baker Street or Winnie Banks Pawnbrokery? Hey, well, we could kind of check out Baker Street, I guess, but let's go straight to the pawnbrokers. We'll come back via Baker Street to examine. 15th of April at Windy Banks Pawnbrokery. So this is a British pawn brokery. Oh my, there are all sorts of tools and contraptions in here that I've never laid eyes on before. Ah, Suzada-san, and that spark of wonder in your eyes. You can't wait to scour the shelves, can you? I get the impression you enjoy places like this. Oh yes, I don't know why, but seeing such a lot of things I don't understand is a real thrill for me. My dear fellows, let us not forget why we are here. Oh, Mr. Sholmes. We are calling on matters of business, not pleasure. And clearly Mr. Shomes means business too, judging from the spark of fury in his eyes. Ah, Mr. Shomes, sir, welcome back. Did you hear that brazen welcome? Well, yes, we are potential customers after all. We are disgruntled customers, Mr. Narahodo, and it's time to inform Mr. Winniebank of our ire. Come, the fight is afoot. Hello? About this violin that isn't a violin. Naturally, you will recall this, which I retrieved from you some days ago. Yes? This second-rate fiddle is not my faithful instrument, Mr. Windebank. The color of the wood is different, it has holes in it, it's not even the same size. 
A wonderful summary of our observations, Mr. Sholmes. I, I'm so very sorry, sir. How utterly unforgivable of me. An inexcusable mistake for a pawnbroker. There's only one way to make amends. I shall have to take my own life! I don't think that will be necessary, do you? If I may just say one thing before I pop off. Ah, yes. It was you, sir, Mr. Sholmes, who took it upon himself to remove the item the other day, I believe. Sorry. As I recall, I entered the storeroom to fetch your violin when I heard, Ah, here it is. You did. And when I turned to controvert you, you had taken the viola and left, sir. However, there can be no doubt that the blame lies firmly at my own door for allowing you to leave. So I shall not grumble or grouse any longer. May this guilt die with me, Viola. No, 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 stop, my dear fellow. The fault is mine. Phew. It would appear that the fight is over. I do humbly apologize, Mr. Windybank. Evidently, my questionable disposition precipitated this tragedy. Well, you wouldn't be Mr. Herlock Sholmes about that questionable disposition now, would you? Ha! Huh. I do believe you may be right, sir! Ha 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 ha! It's either laugh or cry, I suppose. You are, it must be said, one of my more challenging customers. I need to remind you of the peculiar collection of items you brought through my doors in the past. Oh, peculiar items. In the extreme, ma'am. For example, the unpublished manuscript of an eponymous work, the novels of Herlock Sholmes or some such. Oh my, a new full-fledged novel and unpublished, a story I have yet to read, you mean? Ah, forgive me. Wait, before you die, you must tell me more. Okay, it's an unpublished story. I must know more. Tell me everything. Wow, Susanna Sun is really fired up now. Is there really an, an unpublished story under this very roof? Well, one day the gentleman here brought in an old metal chest, you see. I should like to entrust this to your care for a while, Mr. Windbank. Hmm. For a chest like that, one shilling, sir, not a farthing more. It helps with something of very great value indeed. The latest manuscript recounting the adventures of one Mr. Herlock Sholmes. I beg your pardon, a manuscript? You wish to deposit a manuscript? Indeed I do, for I am confident it will be quite safe here. And that was that. As such, Mr. Sholmes' latest tale of otherworldly mystery lies dormant in my storeroom. Mr. Sholmes, is that really true? Do I sense that someone doesn't want to talk about this? I continue to pay your fee, do I not? Kindly continue to store my belongings. Securely. Of course, sir, of course. The safe is out with me, I assure you, on my life. This is all very strange. Please put the gun down. I wonder, could I ask you something? Ah, gentleman from the east, I see. Yes, that's sable suit. I suppose I could offer you sixpence for it. Without wishing to offend, the tone is somewhat dull. Sorry. Aha, but for your splendid attire, ma'am, five guineas, no less. The color's exquisite, the design exotic. Eastern artistry at its finest, may I say. Oh my, five guineas, you say? How interesting. Why do I feel as though I've suffered some sort of defeat here? Actually, I was hoping to ask you about your business. I've heard it said the pawnbrokeries are used rather like banks here in London. Yes, sir, indeed. Many of our customers utilize the establishments as you describe. 
I appraise their items and offer them a proportionate loan and two months of secure stowage. If in that time they repaid the original sum to me plus the agreed interest, their items are happily returned. But what happens if they don't pay you the money? Then the items are offered for sale in my shop, as you can see on the shelves behind me. So you never sell items before the two months has passed then? That's right, ma'am, that's right. Which means some considerable responsibility rests on my shoulders. Should our customer's precious belongings be lost? The only recompense is for me to end it all. The very idea, Mr. Windbank, is an absurdity. One should never talk of one's demise so casually, says the man who was telling us it was all... It was a good day to die only this morning. And let us not forget that I have already helped you take measures to ensure such a tragedy never occurs. Oh, what sort of measures? I engineered a simple device which Mr. Winnebank has, has installed here in his shop. I call it the Red-Handed Recorder. Is that not so, Mr. Winnebank? Ah, uh, What was that deep sigh about? What on earth is a red-handed recorder? Use your eyes, my dear fellow. There are two just below the ceiling. I can see what appears to be a camera attached to some sort of timing device. Very astute. There's indeed a camera furnished with some hundred pieces of celluloid film. And every 30 minutes precisely, the camera automatically records the appearance of the shop. Here, I have an example I can show you. Ah yes, a print of the camera set to record the activity at the shop counter. I developed a special type of film so sensitive it produces a crystal clear image even in darkness. Really? That's extraordinary. Yes, you can clearly see the counter and the door behind it. Look! To see where someone who entered the premises with ill intent, his identity would be summarily exposed. Unless he did it within half an hour. But did you not say the photographic prints were taken at 30 minute intervals? Indeed, as you say, my dear madame. Then what if the incident were to occur in between times? One could only say... That would be a cruel twist of fate. Hmm. I must confess, your devices have been giving me some cause for distress of late. I beg your pardon, Mr. Windbank. Surely they are anything but distressing. Reassuring is the word. It's the cost of the film, sir. You most graciously placed not one, but two cameras in my shop, after all. Which means I must pay for nigh on 100 utterly useless prints every single day. I'm afraid the cost of the film will break me before I'm very much older. Nevertheless, a small price to pay to ensure the safety of my preferred pawnbroker, you know? My dear fellows, we verge on an age where safety and security come at a price. Oh, heaven help us! Now then, Mr. Sholmes, allow me to return your precious violin. Ah, the very thing! Thank you, Mr. Winterbank. Perhaps this might mark the end of the peculiar items you try to pop, hmm? Because if anything were to happen to one of them, this would be the only answer. Um, I really think you ought to stop waving that gun around. Someone could get hurt. Fear not. Sorry? I've only loaded a single bullet, so no one but myself could possibly be harmed. That's not really what I meant. Good day to you then, Mr. Windebank. It's been a pleasure as always, Mr. Sholmes. And you put the gun away. So, Mr. Nanahodo. Now we can explore at last. <laughs> That's really what you want to do, okay. To explore, we shall. Let's look at the curtain first. Twitch it a bit. There seems to be a little door hidden behind that curtain there. That leads to the storage room, where Mr. Windbank keeps articles that are currently in pawn. Ah, I see. There's nothing of particular interest inside. I certainly wouldn't recommend any last in this activity. Recommend or not is not something I intend to do. There's but one key, and Mr. Windbank keeps it in his pocket at all times. Before he sleeps, he places it into a small pot, which he slides under his pillow. 
How on earth do you know about that, Mr. Sholmes? I am a detective, sir. It is my business to know what others do not. I am frequently assailed by information that I neither care for nor wish to retain. Mr. Sholmes, you are a wonder. And the prime suspect of this pawnbrokery is ever burgled. Guess we're not talking to you, then. Look at that enormous ledger open on the counter there. Mr. Winterbank is, if nothing else, very particular about recording the items he accepts. He'd have to be, otherwise he'd get himself into all sorts of trouble. Which might explain the thing that catches my eye far more than ledger. This revolver here. Do not entertain even a single thought of pilfering an article herein, my dear fellow. Huh? I assure you, Mr. Winterbank would not hesitate to draw that weapon with a speed belly belying his portly size. Oh, you, you don't mean he'd... Blow his brains out? Indeed. In recompense for his blunder. Oh my! But in any case, of course we would never do such a thing. How could you even suggest it? I really wish you'd stop doing that, though. This, this adventure has started off kind of dark, hasn't it? <laughs> Look at this! What could this lovely, big, shiny box be? We haven't even got into it yet. That, my dear madame, is a music box. Surely you have such things in your own country? Oh my, yes, but I've certainly never seen one so large before. Shall we listen a while? Ah, what a sublime sound! It's like the music of angels. I've never heard anything like it before in my life. This particular specimen is of the larger variety, commonly found in public houses and restaurants. There is a metal disc inside on which the notes to be played are recorded. Simply by replacing the disc with another, any music you care to imagine can be played. My goodness! What a simply delightful machine! Indeed, though their popularity has waned recently with the development of the gramophone, of course. Ah, Science and technology advance at such an overwhelming pace. What an assortment of things there are on these shelves here. Crockery, footwear, clocks, and watches. Almost anything you care to imagine. Those are forfeited items offered for sale by the pawnbroker. What does that really mean, though? When you pawn, or colloquially pop, an item, the broker loans you money against its worth. He stores the item for an agreed -up period of time after which the loan must be repaid. If not, he is free to display it in his shop for sale at a price of his choosing. Ah, yes. Now you've explained it, I'm noticing little price tags on everything. Of course, simply by paying the agreed interest on the loan, one can extend the period of safekeeping. So you may pawn that black garb of yours without fear, my dear fellow. My treasured university uniform? Never. It embodies my student spirit. None of these hats. There's more over here, though. Dolls aren't. Now, what do you suppose this rather enormous machine does? It seems to have two little windows for looking through. Allow me to enlighten you, my dear fellows. What you are looking at is a stereoscope. A stereoscope? Fascinating! It is aptly named, I assure you. Look through the eyepieces and see for yourself. Oh, I should be delighted to. Excuse me a moment while I just have a look. Just before you do, there is something I should point out. My dear fellows, in order to see the image properly, stereoscopically, as it were, you will need to be cross-eyed. However, if that is beyond you, it is of little consequence today. All right, then. I'm going to try it. Ah! Mr. Delahodo, you must see! At once! Oh, uh, all right, then. So I need to be cross-eyed, like I'm trying to look at my own nose. I... I don't believe it! It's just a photographic print, but it seems like I could reach out and touch it. 
Yes, the sense of depth is startling, is it not? Stereoscopes are one of London's many fads. They are often found in little stalls in the park. People queue for hours to see them. Why? Why are people meddling with such black magic? There's no magic, my dear madame. It is, well... Far too complicated to explain at present. We shall save this lesson for another day. Oh. Is it just that you don't know? Look at this! Whatever could it be used for? Um, um, I have no idea. Ah! There's a small cash just here, look! We're gonna open it, aren't we? Oh my, that's amazing! There's some sort of spring-loaded mechanism! Which we'll never manage to put back to the way it was before. Hmm, what are you two doing? What? Us? Nothing! No, no, nothing at all! Whatever this device is, it seems to have a pair of little windows to look through. Feels as though I've seen something rather similar to this elsewhere. That's not a calendar you could easily miss, is it? 15th of April, today's date. Yes, that's not for sale, I must point out. It is an Eastern-style page-a-day calendar. Every night at midnight, I tear off the front page to reveal the following day's date. The perfect calendar for a tearaway fellow such as yourself, Mr. Windebank. And who was it who walked out of here with the wrong violin before? Well, when the agreed storage period has passed without repayment, articles are forfeited, you see. So I have to keep a close eye on the date. It's something of a pawnbroker's obsession, you might say. Oh yes, I can see you're very dedicated to your job. What? Oh, it happens for it. That ain't fair, and you know it. The article's barely worth a penny, miss. I can offer no more. I, c I cannot offer more. Who? what? Now? Go? I thought we were talking. I don't know there's an argument brewing over by the counter. Come on, that can't be right. Have you even had a proper butcher's at it? I've seen all I need to see, young girl. Hi. Wait. Don't we know... I'm sure I recognize her. Oh yes, it's the young lady from Mr. McGilder's trial two months ago. Her name is Gina Lestrade, my lord. She's a chancer, earns a crust among large crowds, relieving people of their purses. What's commonly called a pickpocket. Gordon Bennett, you lot! <laughs> Gordon Bennett indeed. Hello, Miss Lestrade. I hope you've been well. Hey, didn't that get got from you? Uh, what? You remember me then, do you? Well, I remember being completely surrounded by smoke, that's for sure. So, what are you doing in here? Down and out, like the rest of us. Nothing to eat. Kind of pop that black weasel. Sorry, coat, have ya? What is it about this black uniform that makes everyone comment on it? Ah, good day, unless I'm much mistaken. You would be the young pickpocket who stole our experimental smoke grenade launcher. Ah, it's Jones! So, you have something of value to pawn, do you? Allow me to see the article, and I shall negotiate with Mr. Windebank on your behalf. Pull the other one. I don't need no help from some stuck-up D. Yeah, I'm a business. Go on, or I'll make trouble for you. As you wish, Mr. Strad. I will happily remove myself from your presence. He's really done it. He's gone. I'm sorry, but as I said, there really is no room for negotiation here. What is that thing he has in his hand? Some kind of metal disc. And you, go on, leave me alone. Oh, Mr. Strahd, just pretend we aren't here. We shan't be offended in the slightest. Sona san can really stand her ground when she wants to. Whatever. Hello. 
Somehow I didn't really think you were the sort of person who'd use a pawnbroker, Miss Lestrade. Yeah, well I am, alright? I'm a Londoner, just like everyone else. Is that a problem, is it? No, no, not at all. It's just that, well... Oh, I get it. I know what you're thinking. That thing probably don't even belong to her. Probably got it on the dive, didn't she? Yeah, I can see it written all over your Chevy fate chase face. <laughs> I literally went straight to it instead of the rhyming slang. Yeah, my Chevy chase. Well, I might have been thinking something along those lines. You're not going to deny it, Mr. Narahodo. All right, then. I'm just going to come out and ask you straight. Do you pawn things that you steal from other people? Well, um, I don't know how best to answer that, really. Um... Suppose. Sometimes. You're not going to deny it either, Mr. Stroud. But not this time, all right? I swear! That thing belongs to me! The disc that Mr. Winterbank is holding. Perhaps we should see what he has to say about all of this. Excuse me. Mr. Stroud's disc. Mr. Winterbank, what exactly is this metal disc that Mr. Stroud has brought in? It seems to have hundreds of tiny little bumps on its surface. Ah, this is a music disc, you see, for use inside a music box. In a music box? What? You don't even know what a music box is? You Eason lot ain't too savvy, eh? I know what a music box is. I've just never seen one of these discs before. The small protrusions on the metal disc encode the tune to be played by the music box. You simply insert the disc and set the machine going, and beautiful music plays! It's so incredible! Tell us, what tune is on this disc? Well, I'm afraid I couldn't tell you that. There are so many different types of music box you see. British made, German, Swiss. I have no way of knowing which particular machine this disc was made for. Ah, I see. And that's it in a nutshell. I wouldn't have any customers for an item like this, even if the young lady forfeited it. Really, I'm already offering more than I should at the penny. That's a packet of lies. He told me he did. He said it was, well... He? Who? Never you mind. It just ain't right, that's all. That is worth good money. I know it is. Well then, you'll have to try your luck at another pawnbroker's, won't you? Ah. Well, tell us of Gina Lestrade and the dealings you do with her. Which are obviously wrong in the first place. Can you get in trouble for it? We've been before, of course. There's a little Tatum. Tata de Marlin? What the hell does that mean? Little Tata de Marlin. I see. And brought some dubious article over with her every single time, I might add. Dubious? What are you trying to say? I'm an honest customer, me. So, is there something dubious about the discs you brought in today? Well, if only it were that simple. Sorry, what do you mean? What she actually brought in was a storage ticket. Ah, storage ticket. So... Mr. Stroud has actually come to redeem an article from you today, is that right? Yeah, that's right. A girl like me has a lot of stuff what needs storing. Alright, yes, that's definitely dubious. The article in question would have been forfeited at midnight tonight. But if she gave me the ticket for it and repaid both the loan and the interest, I was obliged to return the article to her. But what was the article? Do tell us, Mr. Winterbank. Little scamp is wearing it, ma'am. It's the overcoat that she redeemed. Oh! What? What's wrong with that? It fits, doesn't it? I mean, it's mine, so of course it does. So, what about the disc, then? How does that come into all of this? Ah, the disc is something else. A new article to pawn, if the girl and I can agree a price. Okay, the new article. I'm confused. I thought you said that Mr. Stroud brought in a storage ticket today. It's really quite simple. Yes, the child brought me a storage ticket and the money owed on it, as you say. For this heavy black coat, do you return to her care, as I'd understood it? That's right. Yes. And rather unsurprisingly, as soon as the little ragamuffin put the thing on, 
She went rifling through the pockets. Oh, you mean... What? Don't you know it's rude to stare at a lady? Ah, I see. So it came from the pocket of the overcoat, did it? If you mean this disc, then yes, exactly, ma'am. And she immediately tried to pawn it. Quite a high price as well. It's all rather suspicious, I think. Give it up. I'm just trying to pawn something like anyone else would. Mr. Strad, may I ask who deposited the overcoat here in the first place? Um, well, me? It doesn't really appear to be your size. Me old man! It's me old man's, ain't it? it is it, Mr. Strad? Yes, this is definitely all rather suspicious. Out of my way, please! Now, who is this to come in when everything suspicious is going on? Another person enters the scene as our outro makes us exit the scene. Oh, we have met Gina Lestrade again. A coat from a previous case? From a previous person in a previous case. With a musical disc inside that I would very much like to hear the tune of before any pawning takes place. But before that, someone's bustling in. Who could it be? We'll find out next time on The Great Ace Attorney. I'll see you guys then for more. Bye-bye.